You know what my least favorite part of the trial is? It isn't listening to the defense argue that her client is not guilty. She has a right to do that. It isn't even listening to what I believe and I, I'm going to tell you what I, what I think is inaccurate. My least favorite part of the trial is that even where we're standing here and our criminal justice system provides for justice for victims and my job is to advocate for them and I'm standing up here and I'm doing that. I've been doing that all week and several weeks before and I'll keep doing it. You know what my least favorite part is? It doesn't take away any of the suffering. It doesn't take it away. So don't deliver a verdict thinking that it will, because it doesn't. Your job is to follow the law and use your common sense when you consider the evidence. I embrace the high burden of beyond a reasonable doubt. I believe in it wholeheartedly, devoted my whole life to it. I embrace it. It's what we use for every prosecution in this country, every single day of every year, for decades and decades and decades. decades. That's the burden we have. And it is not, despite what the, the argument is always, any possible doubt. You have to be 100% sure. If you're 100% sure, we probably don't need criminal trials. And you can't be. You, we can't be. That doesn't make any sense, does it? We can't get inside the head of people who commit violent crimes or any crime and decide what they knew and what they wanted and if they loved their kid. I hope he, did. I hope he does, by the way. I assume he does. We all do. We all love our kids. That's not my job. It's not my burden. So I embrace my burden, but I'm not going to embrace something that's just not true. Because it is not true that I have to prove, and the people of the state of Michigan have to prove, what James Crumley knew. It is not true that the people of the state of Michigan has to prove, have to prove that he didn't, that he knew his son was going to kill somebody. We've talked about this before. If that were the case, he'd be charged with murder. That's not my burden. That is not what I have to prove. The judge is going to instruct you what burden. It's a, it's a reasonable burden. And it's as to the elements that I have to prove. Only the elements. Beyond a reasonable doubt, using your common sense and your reason, the elements, and what are the elements? You're not going to hear that the elements of this crime are that I have to prove what he knew, what he actually knew. That's not the law, ladies and gentlemen. That is not the law. The law is I have to prove beyond a reasonable doubt what a person, a reasonable person, would do using ordinary care. That's what I have to prove. There's a couple things I have to correct. The questions defense counsel asks witnesses are not evidence. It's the answers that's, that are evidence. And you have to decide whether that's credible. But Special Agent Brandon did not testify that it was a, pro, it was, it was a safe he would, he would call that secure if an un, a, a unloaded gun was stored separately. In fact, that's not what he testified. What he testified to was that it wasn't, storing the firearm or ammunition wouldn't make it secure if you had a 15-year-old who knew how to load and shoot that gun. That was his testimony. You did not hear from people at the school that they were not concerned. That was not, that was not the testimony. You did not hear that James Crumbly uh, was, went home because he was trying to check on his son and he was worried. None, none of that happened. You heard the 911 call. You have to rely on what you heard. 
not the questions that were asked. Defense counsel put up a statement from the journal about my gun and where my dad hit it. And she's urging you to find that credible. But if you do, and and, and we argue you should find, you, it's, all, it's all credible. You don't get to pick one statement from a journal and say he was telling the truth there, but all the stuff about how he asked his dad for help, that wasn't the truth. You're, you have to use common sense, and I'm not going to go through every single thing that, the, that Ms. Lehman told you, because I know that you, you were all taking notes and you all listened to it, and, and I laid out, and I know you remember the testimony. But the one thing I'm just going to ask you one more time is, I embrace my burden, but I, you have to hold me to the law and what I actually have to prove and what the judge tells you I have to prove, which comes down to common sense and reasonableness. Let's step back. We have a person, we have a father, who purchased a gun as a gift he knows he has it. He knows he knows how to use it. He knows he's in the house by himself after it's purchased. He gets called to the school. He gets called to the school, and the words on the paper, the drawing on the paper is of that gun. You heard, you, you heard Special Agent Brandon. The testimony speaks for itself, and so does the drawing. He saw the words, blood everywhere. He saw the image on the paper with the bullets and the person bleeding. He understands exactly, because the, I mean, the, the image is there and, and you saw it, that's exactly where those bullets landed. The thoughts won't stop. Help me. I want help, but my parents don't listen to me, so I can't get any help. And then that day, just hours before, help me. Use common sense. It doesn't make any sense to stand here and say someone had no idea that he needed help when he saw on the page, help me. It doesn't make any sense. Because any reasonable person, which is the standard you have to use, using ordinary care would know that. Because it actually says, help me. The world is dead. My life is useless. Those messages you saw, that's exactly what he thought. We know what was going on because of the messages in this journal. And then, we know there was a cable lock. You did not hear any testimony about who owned that gun and whether that lock was used or, used, or another lock was used. But you do know that whoever purchased that gun had to be 21 years old. You do know that. We've been telling you since this case started, it would take tragically small things to make this, to prevent these deaths. And you're hearing a lot about how to store a weapon. And the truth is, this has nothing to do with a safe storage lock, and you don't have to lock a weapon up to make it secure. There's lots of ways to make it secure. But what, what isn't secure is leaving it around, which we know he did with his other weapon, leaving it around, my dad left it out, LOL, I thought, why not, loaded, knowing that, your, that your, your ammo is right there. We know that is not secure. But let's talk about one of the ways that we can prevent access to minors. This is the murder weapon. This is the gun. We know, we presented evidence of this. I'm gonna put it right on the table. This is a cable lock. This little piece of cord. This is me inserting the cable lock. We know that a cable lock was in the home. We know it was provided. This is me inserting the cable lock. That takes less than 10 seconds. It takes less than 10 seconds. 10 seconds. 
You don't have to go find it. You don't have to go buy it. It was provided. It was right there. You just watched me do it. Ten seconds of the easiest, simplest thing. One of which, by the way, not the only way. Locking was not the only way to prevent this, but it was one way, and it took less than ten seconds. sister say, yeah, he went and got the gun from his bedroom. These are the other two guns. Ladies and gentlemen, the guns were kept in the bedroom. The family was there when, it was, when he was, um, she was told that, and everyone knew. The guns were kept in the bedroom. This is where he says he hid the gun. The armor. This is, where, this is what it looked like that day. Wet towels folded over it. It wasn't even closed. He says it was in the armor under some jeans. This is not hiding a weapon. This is just where you kept it. It is not reasonable to conclude that a 15-year-old who spends all kinds of time in the house alone would not, would, would not know where it was because it wasn't hidden. This isn't a case where we have a parent who like, hides a, a weapon far out of reach from a child who couldn't get to it, doesn't know it exists, ammunition in a totally separate spot, the kid, that's not this case. It's reason and common sense is what we have to use. We know that James Crumbly went home and looked for a gun when he heard there was an active shooter, and we know he referenced there was that meeting at the school. That's foreseeability, and that's a person who suspects their own son. And that is what I have to prove. Foreseeability to an ordinary, a reasonable person using ordinary care. This case is not a statement about guns. It's not a statement about parental responsibility. It's not about kids doing kids things. The kids on November 30th in that building were doing kids' things. Hannah, Madison, Tate, Justin, they were going to class. They were talking to their friends. They were dancing in the hallway. Those are kids' th kid things. Parenting is the hardest job that we'll ever do. The hardest job and one of the most important ones, but it's exhilarating and joyful and the best experience of our lives. We look at our kids when they're born and we see hope. But they can break their heart, your heart. They're supposed to. They have to leave someday. They don't come with a set of instructions. I'm not here to tell you that this case is about somebody who didn't follow the instructions to be a perfect parent. But we do have a guide. We do have a basic, basic standard for ordinary care. We all have doubts about our kids. We all worry every minute of every day that they're going to do something or something's going to happen to them, and then it might be because of something we did or we didn't do. We are not responsible for everything our kids do. This prosecution, in this case, is not inconsistent with that. It just isn't. This is a very egregious and rare, rare set of facts. We do have a measuring stick, ladies and gentlemen, and it's the law. And it requires us to use ordinary care. And there is a consequence if we don't, in a very limited, limited way that the law allows a parent to be charged. Your job now is to go back there and use your reason and common sense and follow the law. That's what your job is. You listen to all the evidence, and at the end, you will conclude 
that James Crumbly failed. He might love his kid, I hope he does. But stick to what I have to prove. Stick to what I have to prove. And remember that he didn't just fail in his duty to his son. He failed in his duty to protect Hannah and Justin and Madison and Tate. And I'm not, I don't, I don't say their names to evoke sympathy. I say their names because they matter. They matter. And that is why we are here. We are absolutely here about what happened in that school that day. Because if James Crumbly had done even the smallest of things, like the 10-second cable lock, or gone home, or, or took responsibility for his kid who was in trouble, those kids wouldn't have been shot and killed in that school on that day. I have met my burden. Mr. Keese and I, the people of the state of Michigan, have met the burden to find James Crumley guilty of four counts of involuntary manslaughter. And I ask you to return that verdict. Thank you. Thank you, Prosecutor.